Thank you so much for joining Expectations of the Culture. My name is Essence Clark, and I am the host and executive producer of this podcast. You have decided to join us for episode 102, entitled There Is No Manual. In this episode, we will be discussing being a child raised by a parent with mental illness or mental disorders. We will also be discussing being a parent with mental illness, raising children. And lastly, we will be discussing being a parent whose child has a mental illness or disorder. I'm so excited to be introducing today's guest. She is someone who is near and dear to me, and I'm happy to call her my friend. Like a phoenix, I have seen her rise from the ashes and stake to claim what is hers. And despite the naysayers and possible statistics, she has defied the expectations of the culture of being a product of her environment. She is a strong black woman, a loving mother, a devoted daughter, an inspirational friend, but she's also a CEO, Amazon's best-selling author, motivational speaker. I, I, I could keep going. I could go for <laughs> days with this. Listen, and don't let me forget, I have to always add that she is an all-around boss in every way, in every form. So please, guys, welcome Tammy Stanley, CEO and founder of Prevailing Queens. Yes, I love that introduction. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I am all of that and more. And I want to take the time to thank you for having me on EOTC tonight. Um, thank you. It's actually a blessing to have people surrounded around you that is willing and open to putting you out there to receive as much exposure as you can. Um, it's a blessing to have people with platforms um, to just want to offer their platform to, to you so that you can have the opportunity to put yourself out there, promote yourself, you know, and network with others. So I thank you for having me. Thank you so much for thank accepting you. the invitation. I'm so happy to just really um, showcase everything that you're doing. Cause I know I tell you all the time, I'm just so proud of you. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. you're so inspirational and I love to hear you speak. So I definitely want my followers to just also see how good you are. So here we go. Let's get started with today's interview. Right. So let me know what inspired you to share your story. Well, um, something that is very important within me mental illness, it's a very important skill, um, very important, you know, tool that's, that it really needs to be used, but a lot of people stray away from it because they don't want to be considered crazy or not with the cool crew. Mm -hmm. And that is therapy. Um, I've actually had a few therapy sessions and within those sessions, I was able to share with my therapist the things that I was going through and the emotions that I was, you know, feeling at the time um, and the confusion. So I actually had the opportunity to share my story and I haven't shared my story or talked about it for about nine, eight, nine years. And once I finally got the opportunity to let it out to someone, I felt relieved. And once I told her, she said, I feel like you have many, many books to write. And I was like, man, I've been hearing this, but <laughs> coming from you is just, it's hidden different for me. So <laughs> I took the opportunity, I took her word, and I decided to share my story on social media, Instagram actually. I did an Instagram live and I shared my story on live and I got so much positive feedback that I didn't wanna stop there. I wanted to continue to go any way that I could and I've just been going ever since. Yes, you have. You have been very busy, very yeah. busy. Definitely rubbing elbows with the right people. You have been able to, you've been invited into very private you know, um, spaces to be able to speak to people who are sufferers or, or people who are survivors, I guess, at this point, by the time you've met them, right? And um, 
that's just so amazing. Like you really have been trying to get everything out, get your story out and let people know, listen, like this is not the end. Like you can really still do everything. You can still be successful and you can still be happy. You don't have to live in that. So I definitely, you know, we're definitely promoting the book. Please show the front of your book real quickly for everybody to see. Thank you. The fairy tale ends. So, of course, what we don't want to do is give you the whole story, but let's see if we could get a little teaser from you about oh, sure. what, what, what is your story? I mean, we're so, talking about it, but what is it? <laughs> holding up the book, this is an image that I created myself, um, and it took a lot of thought. It took a lot of weeks and months for me to actually come up with this design and title this is an image of my dad and this is an image of myself and the title relates to the image and it relates because um the fairy tale is my life so i thought i was living a fairy tale life you know i had everything that i could ever imagine you know i was raised in a two-parent household something that's very rare but i was blessed to have that opportunity um, I had three other siblings. Well, I have three other siblings and we all just stuck together. We never wanted for anything. And I consider that to be a fairy tale because a lot of people dream of having their mom and dad in one home. A lot of people dream of still having a relationship with their siblings and actually being in one home with one another. Like we're, we're on bunk beds. <laughs> like we're not, we're, in, no one can separate us at this time. So um, it was a fairy tale. And I actually had the opportunity to move to a different state, which is Atlanta and um, move from New York to Atlanta and moving to, New, to Atlanta was a blessing, a blessing in disguise. Um, my dad moved this into like a mansion something we've never experienced. And so for us, it literally was like, man, it's a dream come true. And everything was going fine, but we also suffered from watching a lot of domestic violence over 21 years of domestic violence in our household. So the image that we had on the outside was perfect. That was the fairy tale. But when you step into our home, that was the disaster. So once we arrived in Atlanta, you know, we thought things would change. We were no longer going to experience, you know, those trauma events, but it actually got worse and it resulted to my mom taking my dad's life. Um, she actually did what they call snapped. It was actually um, put out there to be premeditated murder and it changed my life ever since. It changed my sister's life. It changed both of my brother's lives. It changed my grandmother, my dad's mom. Um, it changed my mom. <laughs> it changed all of us in a way that I can't even explain for them. I can only explain for myself, but I, I can tell that there's a lot of mental illness within all of us. And so that's why I wanna be on your podcast to share this because I've experienced it in so many different ways and I've seen it in so many different people. But the thing is, people are in denial. And I, that's something I want us to talk about, <laughs> people being in denial. So yeah, this book means everything to me. And um, it just gives you an insight of how I grew up in a domestic violence household and what the ending result was from a woman being abused for over 21 years to ending up snapping. And yes. that's what we got. Yeah. Great, great story, guys. Uh, again, the fairy tale ends. Uh, just to give you a little bit more information on where you could get that, it is available on her website, www.prevailingqueens.com. It is $17.99 plus shipping. And it's also available on Amazon. So if you have a Kindle, you could get the ebook right away. I um, mean, you don't have to wait on the shipping. Okay, so we will give you more information about that book again. But we don't want to give too much. You got to read it. You can't right. you gotta everything. Get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, I get it. You know, we're so used to having information right away. No, yeah. <laughs> this is her teaser. Yeah. Listen, it's a good story. It's a great story. 
So let's just talk a little bit more about your experience. Um, would you say, or can you confirm if either of your parents have ever been diagnosed with mental illness? I cannot confirm that they have been diagnosed, but um, I can definitely say that they showed signs of it. And hearing, you know, families have the family secrets, right? So a lot of things you won't understand as a child, but as you get older, you'll start to put the puzzles, the pieces to the puzzle together and it, everything will start to make more sense. And so that was my thing as I got older and I started to hear the family secrets. Things were getting exposed that I didn't even think could have possibly happened. And so when I seen my dad respond to my mom in a certain way, instantly I would think something affected my dad. <clears throat> and it affected him in a way that he doesn't know how to control it. <clears throat> so at this point, to me, it was just like, he's, he doesn't have control of his emotions. He doesn't have control of his feelings. <clears throat> He doesn't really know how to respond to things that affect him. And the only thing that I figured out that he knew to do would, was lash out. And um, granted, I did feel that he loved us. He loved my mom um, unconditionally. But what's love when someone is like beating you? <clears throat> That's not... That's not showing someone that you you really, really love, love them or have these emotions and feelings for them. Um, and so hearing some of the stories with my dad, it was just like, he's affected by his childhood and they have something, they say gener generational curses. I feel like he was a part of generational curses. I feel like my, <laughs> his parents, had a tough time with him or he experienced thing and things and watched things that affected him as he grew up. And for my mom, she was very timid, very shy, very to herself. <clears throat> and I felt like her parents affected her in a way. She was so sheltered and not sheltered in a way of um, she can't do certain things. Like her parents were tough. She was sheltered in a way that she was she didn't know how to respond to other people. So she just kind of stayed in her corner. Um, and then just watching the both of them react and respond to certain situations, it just didn't seem humanly to me. It just seemed like, man, this is not normal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Something's not right here, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't think I would respond that way. So yeah, and I don't see other families respond that way. Like the fact that you feel like you have to hit a woman mm -hmm. to get your point across, yeah. something isn't right within you. And that's a big sign of mental illness. Very, very big. I feel like my dad suffered from depression at times. Um, and I say that because, you know, he would like his funds to be a certain way. And if it wasn't, then everyone's in trouble, you know. Um, and for my mom... Her face and her body language showed her, her mental illness, like her just being silent and to herself. That's not normal. I don't think anyone would think that's normal. <laughs> right. So, you know, and, and, and I don't know how often you and I, I'm, I'm trying to sit here and think now, um, are you aware that I grew up in a domestic violence household as well? Um. I'm not quite aware of it. I don't think we ever like fully spoke about it. Yeah. So crazy, right? So yeah. <laughs> I grew up also in a domestic violence household. Um, definitely was a daddy's girl. Super, super daddy's girl. Yeah. And um, he had a child before me. I didn't really have a relationship with my brother. but um, And then my mom, she had other children as well who weren't in the same household that we were in. So I was kind of like the only child you know, mm -hmm. living in New York with my parents or whatever. And 
my father uh, i don't i'm pretty sure he's never been diagnosed but i can definitely let you know <laughs> based on what i know about mental illness right now he should have definitely been um diagnosed with bipolar disorder yeah. um he was an addict all the way around in every which way whether it was alcohol drugs i mean he just was completely an addict completely and that was very hard, you know, on me and my mother. My mother, here she is, basically has to be a single mother. Even though he's there, he's not there, you know what I mean? And he's the breadwinner. He was making great money working for a very reputable company. And I don't know if it was one of those situations. Well, honestly, my mom stayed with my father because of her religion, her religious choice. Mm -hmm. So until he was no longer in our household, he was violent the entire time and they did not get a divorce until i believe i was 11 or 12. so wow. yeah i lived into about about 12 years wow of domestic <laughs> violence and really horrible things like i mean i remember one time coming home from uh where you know where my mom went to worship and um all her things were cut up torn up it was dead winter brooklyn blizzards okay you know how cold it is yeah <laughs> literally cut and tore all of her winter clothes and only left her summer clothes so for a person to even think of that it's like that yeah there's gotta be some something wrong in there because like a normal person wouldn't do this you know what i mean and i guess maybe and i don't want to be offensive by saying a normal person but when i say normal i mean a person who has a healthy, you know, mental state and it's right. not suffering from any disorders or right. illnesses, you know what I mean? So yeah, we definitely are and have a commonality with that. And so in your experience, you know, how do you think mental illness affected you as a child or how do you think it affects a child like in a household? Well, um, in my experience, um, I believe a lot of things have been passed down. A lot of behaviors have been passed down to the children. Um, I feel like I have a temper, like how my dad did, but not to his extent. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have like triggers, like, you know, I'm immune to hearing yelling. I'm immune to like, you know, oh, if the child is wrong, spank them, you know, because that that's, that's what I received. That's what was reciprocated over and over and over in our home almost every day. Like that was the plan of discipline, you know, um, using profanity, thinking that's a way of disciplining, you know, um, I would sometimes catch myself because I could see a kid and don't get me wrong. My children does not have to be disciplined in any shape or form of that way because they're very well, put together and very, very well behaved children. So I thank God I don't have to express my anger in that way that my dad did, you know. Um, but I would catch myself. I would see children maybe lashing out in the store with their mom. And instantly I would think, <laughs> my dad would have spanked you. <laughs> you would have gotten a spanking because no. There is not even no talking to you right now. There is, you need a fuck or something. And that's bad because you can talk to someone, you know, like you can, words is a lot. You know, words can be used in so many ways. It could be used to comfort. It could be used to discomfort. It could be used for anger. It, be, it could be used to evaluate all types of things. So it all depends on how you use them. You know, as I say, it's not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. So if you're demanding me and you're cursing at me, I'm going to look at you like, oh, I'm not doing what you're saying because you're not, you're not giving it to me as, like you say, a normal person would. And so I'm going to take it differently. But if you just calmly express how you feel, I will receive it in a different way. And that's something that my, my dad, you know, didn't do and I sometimes find myself not knowing how to address situations. 
So it affected me in so many ways. I mean, even with relationships, like it's just been passed down. I watched my siblings, you know, I watched my brother. He has a temper too. He's quick like to, to respond. He's quick to be like, hey, you want to fight? Because this is what we're immune to. So it definitely affects your children. It definitely rubs off on them in a way that you probably won't even be able to fix. And it all boils down to them seeking therapy and learning how to express those emotions rather than physically using those emotions towards someone else. So yes, it, 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 as a child and four kids, four parents, they need to know that your child can be affected by your mental illness. It definitely can. Um, and then your child will pass it down to their spouse and their children. And then it just keep going. And it's a repeated cycle that no one's willing to end. But, but, you, know, but you know why no one's willing to end it, right? It's, because I mean, the stigma and the bias behind right? it. Right. No one, you can't say... I'm having a bad day today and that bad day can't last for more than a couple of hours. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, you have to either hide it or, um, you know, there were times where I would just withdraw. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah, I, yeah. I completely understand what you're saying. Now in the spirit of being organic, cause you don't, you don't move me away from my next question. <laughs> So I'm going to step out of that line of questioning right now because I think you just brought up something that was really good that I promised that we would discuss. Mm -hmm. um, you brought up um, being a child, being the, ch okay, you discussed being a child of parents with mental illness, but also how that triggers you when you're disciplining your children. So I want to kind of get into that um, just a little bit because I could definitely resonate with that. I also suffer from triggers uh, when it comes to discipline of my children. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that. What does that look like for you? Like, what would you say is one of your triggers? Well, um, for starters, you know, becoming a mom at 21 years old, first child, I literally had no idea what I was going to walk into, especially not having the support that I needed. Um, so all I would pray about is, please don't make me be like my dad. Please don't make me be like my dad. Please don't. And I wasn't even saying my mom, but I should have been saying both. But because I knew my, my dad was more the physical person and I knew how him being physical towards me or my mom or my youngest brother, how that affected us, it was just like, I don't want my kids to hate me. I know how I felt like I would look my dad in the eye like, man, ooh, I wish I could, I could hit you back, you know, like, and, and, and I knew how angry it would make me feel knowing or seeing him abuse my mom and it's nothing I could do about it. I'm literally just sitting here watching this happen. You're blacking her eye, you're breaking her fingers, you're dislocating her shoulders. And all I can do is stand there. So as a child, I'm just like, I never want to be him ever. I want to be the providing side of him, but I don't want to be the monster side of him. And yes, I said monster because when he was upset, he wasn't my dad. He was someone else. And I never wanted my children to look at me like, man, my mom is someone else. One day she's okay, the next day she's not. And so, like I said, thankfully my children, and I think I kind of set the tone, you know, for them because my, my, my son's dad, he is very um, calm and playful with my son. And then my daughter's dad, He's very calm and laid back, you know, like he's like, let your mom discipline you. Like, I would never touch you. I would never yell at you. Let your mom handle that. And that's kind of tough at times because I will yell sometimes. Like sometimes I just can't. I just can't. And I feel like as a mom, we all have those days where we just can't. 
you know, we have so much going on. We have so much on our plate. We're trying to just make sure everything's perfect, knowing that there's no such thing as perfect, but we still want to be perfect for our family. So therefore, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to go above and beyond and do whatever it is that it takes to make sure no one has anything to say at the end of the day about my family, because guess what? We're straight. We're good. And mommy did that, you know, not saying dad didn't, but mommy's going to make sure we all looking good, you know? And so I set the tone with my son and my daughter. I have the voice where I can be like, hey. It's a, it's a little tone. You know how the, the mom got that little tone where you like, she's serious right now. She's not playing. And, but it's just that simple to just put a little tone to your voice. It's not necessary to say, I'm going to hit you or I'm going to throw you down the steps. That's happened to my little brother. He got thrown down the steps. You know, like I talk to my children. I tried to be the complete opposite of what my parents were to me. And, and triggers for me um, would be disobeying. I have a tough time with disloyalty. I have a tough time with dishonesty. I have a tough time with you pretty much going around, you know, what I'm explaining or what I asked of you. You know, I struggle with that. I have a tough time with trusting. So with my children, if I explain something, I feel like you should receive it. If you don't understand, you should have a conversation with me and tell me you don't understand or ask, you know, well, mom, I'm not comfortable. Just communicate with me. I'm very big on communicating with my children. But I know at times, in this day and era, I'm not going to lie. Some of them need a little spanking now. <laughs> some of them, some of them, you got to get up in their face and be like, listen, here, I'm the mom. Right. You know? Because yes. it's, it, it's, tough. Yeah. it's tough. Now, now, now what I'm speaking about, my children are small, you know, I don't have teenagers. So I'm starting from now with the communication, but best believe, when you hit the teens and you think you can step in my face, <laughs> you got to be story. real with yourself. You know, yeah. like you yeah. have to, you have to set that tone with your child. Like, listen, that's what we aren't going to do. Goodness, Tammy, you are taking me all over the place. I'm sorry. Like, oh, I'm sorry. That's another part of the segment. I'm Goodness. sorry. I'm all sorry. right. <laughs> so now that we're there, you know what I'm saying? Let me, let me just go ahead and throw in my little one and two cents real quick on that. So I, too, suffer from triggers. Um, and at the end of the day, my mother's story is her own story to share. So that's not something that I, I, I plan on really divulging too much about. But, you know, she has her own diagnosis and she didn't get diagnosed until later on in life. Um, so I do realize that one of the things that I suffered from or one of the things that I, um, how I was affected as a child living in a household of, with domestic violence, I was very timid very, very timid. I was very easily scared because I did not, I literally had no clue what I was coming home to. Right. I mean, my mom was cool, right? But I didn't know where my father was going to be. I, I don't know if he was out on a binge and he didn't come home that night. So when he come home, he's going to be high as hell or if he's going to be the dad that I love who gets me whatever I want and bakes me strawberry cake with strawberry icing. Like I just, I just didn't know who or what to expect when I got home. Right. And so that, ex that was extremely damaging for me because I, I felt like I was always so nervous. Like I was always so scared, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, with my mother and her, you know, her own diagnosis, I mean, you know, she really did the best that she could. Like my mom was a great mother. One thing I could say about her is I could say a lot of great things about my mom. Right. But like, I think the thing for me is I know what she went through and I know how she fought for us at least right. she fought for me and her you know what I'm saying so it's like even if you have your own diagnosis like you fought through all of that you fought through my father being violent with you you yeah. fought through his own issues with mental illness which which 
supported his addiction. You know what I mean? Now you're fighting through your own thing that you don't even know you have because you've never been diagnosed. Right? You know, it's like, I could only respect her at, like, in this point in life. So now, here we are. I'm going to organically go with the conversation. Now we're talking about children and how we're parenting our kids. So, you know, it's like, for me, I could not spank my children. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I had to spank one of my children, and I did it because I was told to, not because I wanted to. And I, I boohoo cried bald it, it just didn't make i think i cried more than them it just didn't it just didn't make any sense like why, why? you know what i'm saying like for me it is a huge trigger for me to have to physically discipline you if, if it involves belt spanking hitting in any, any way shape or form i don't want to do it i don't want to deal with it i don't okay. want to do that it makes me unhappy right so i had to find other ways to discipline but now that leads into another caveat right what i do like is and something that i talk to people about you have chosen to be your own style parent right you have not chosen to repeat what your parents and how they chose to parent yeah. right and and then that there it goes there goes that expectation so many people become their own parents they don't understand it but right. you have chosen as an adult like yo this is how i'm gonna adult i'm not gonna yell i'm not gonna throw you down the stairs right but when i add that little bit of tone you better move that ass yeah go get it done real quick exactly <laughs> <laughs> you know what i'm saying so, yo, thank you. Like, I appreciate the fact that you have chosen the type of parent that you want to be. And that's what I've done. Like, I don't, again, mom, hands down, bomb, okay? She literally took care of me by herself, at, you know, my entire childhood because my father was an addict. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Look what you created. Like, look who, I'm, I'm on camera now, ma. Good <laughs> job. You know what I mean? Yeah. So congratulations to you on that for choosing how you want to parent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to step away from us for a minute so we can kind of get a breather. You know, I don't want us to be overwhelmed with too much um, of the personal effects of what we dealt with. But I do have uh, a segment and it's my social street experience. And it's where I kind of go to the social streets, especially since we're, you know, under COVID. So I can't really hit the streets and the pavements right. and ask these questions. But one of the things that I asked some of my um, people who I'm in different groups and we have similar experiences is what was it like being raised as a child with a parent with mental illness or disorders. So I'm going to share some of those experiences. I have about 10 of them. Um, some you may resonate with, some you don't. So let's just, you know, kind of go through it together or whatever. So the first thing I had was she never admitted her crushing depression and neither did I until I was diagnosed. Um, I have an episode coming up. I'm so excited about it. It's supposed to be about people who are not diagnosed and how that affects others. You know what I mean? Like, so for me as a child, my mother was undiagnosed until later on, until I was actually out of her household and I was an adult. And then she, you know, she had triggers, straws, broke the camel's back kind of thing. And then, you know, she received her diagnosis. So I, I can understand what that's like being with someone who can't even admit it. I, I personally struggle with admitting it. Right. It's difficult. Like nobody wants to be diagnosed. Nobody wants to have that label because that's the stigma that's been created. And I'm not sure, did you share, did you get a chance to share how you relate with mental illness other than outside of, do you have any relations to mental illness outside of your parents? Well, um, I have suffered from depression. I've never been diagnosed but I've showed all symptoms. Mm -hmm. I went from 138 pounds to 98 pounds in less than a month. Um, I shut myself out from the world. I didn't answer my phone. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't talk to anyone. I literally secluded myself. I didn't get out the bed. I slept for hours. I didn't eat at all. And when I did eat, it felt like I just want to throw up everything in me because I just, I was forcing myself. And it's something as small as a piece of potato chip. And the moment it touches my mouth, I'm like, ugh, I can't do this. 
I, I just don't want it. Um, I lost myself badly, badly, and it took me months to actually gain that confidence back, gain that strength back, you know, gain my sanity back. And the 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 the, the strangest part about it is no one checked for me. Because guess what? They're in denial that I was depressed. They just thought, I would hear things like, you still in the bed? It's after one. You still sleeping? Oh, why you sleep so much? You're lazy. None of the above. There's not a lazy bone in my body. But when depression comes and crush you, it is nothing you can do about it. If you don't fight it off before it gets too deep within you, there is, it takes complete control over you. And it's nothing you can do about it. It's nothing anyone can do for you. But the best thing people can do is show that they were there. And they couldn't be there because they were in denial, as so many other folks are in denial about having depression. Um, I've reached anxiety moments and I've never been diagnosed with it, but my hands tremble, I mean, extremely, and don't let me be in a situation where there's violence going on or someone yelling or something catches me off guard, like a loud sound or something's happening with my children or I feel uneasy about a situation with a person that's in the same room with me or lying next to me as my partner. I feel uneasy towards you and I start shaking. And it's not a body thing, but it's a hand thing. My hands just tremble nonstop. Now, as I got older, I've tried, I've learned how to control it. But sometimes it could get as bad as me not being able to control it to the, to the point where I start to feel weak. Um, and so, I literally just try to cope with my situations. I most definitely feel like there's anxiety within me. There's, there, there, I did have depression at some point. So I just try to move forward and, and build and find ways to cope with, with that situation. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, listen, um, admitting it to me is the first step. You know, um, and again, I agree with you. I've I've admitted very serious mental health Ill, or mental illness symptoms, and had my family members diminish it or minimize it. Like, girl, that's nothing. Like, oh, okay, you know. So you really have to be in tune with yourself to even be able to admit that you are suffering. Right. And it's so sad that so many suffer in silence because they don't know any difference or they feel like they can't say anything. And that's the whole purpose of this podcast. I want to open up this conversation. So many people are affected. One in five. One in five people. If you know 20 people, how many people got it? Right. Oh, it's 20. <laughs> probably, probably 20, right? Yes, it's 20 for sure. <laughs> Um, the next experience I want to share, she says, my mom is bipolar and I live in a horrible hoarder house for my entire childhood. Sucked. Now here I am constantly depressed and I try not to place blame, but it is what it is. But it really is, isn't what it is, what it is. You know what I mean? Like I used to say that, like, it's just, it is what it is. Mm. That's being passive in this. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It bothered you. It's not, it, it isn't, it, it isn't, is what it is. It actually is. Yeah. That shit bothered me. Yes. Yes. And say it and be okay with that. Maybe because you lived in a hoarder household, now your house is clean. You know what I mean? Like, get the positivity out of that. You know what I mean? Like, ah, I'm so clean because my mom was a hoarder. Right. This one is a little bit longer, but I wanted to read it to you because I just felt like, it's just so many layers to it. So 
the person said we had a strained relationship both of my both of my lives so i'm believing this she's referring to her mother or they're referring to their mother i know she loved me but she didn't make it easy to love her back she suffered horrible depression and anxiety and i suspect was undiagnosed bipolar she had some addictions one which took her life and they had life hard for my dad too for most of their 51 years together so life was hard for his father or their father uh, we did reach out to each other nine months before she died and, and made peace with everything. So at least they were able to, you know, make peace with their mother and, and, and their experience. But I mean, wow, can you imagine the dad, 51 years dealing with someone, you know, with mental illness? It had to be really difficult based on, you know, if you had your own strained relationship with your child, I mean, that that relationship was probably strained too. I mean, she probably really suffered, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I don't think people really understand how suffering resonates physically and, and emotionally and, and verbally and, um, you know, whatever state your mind is, is in. I mean, hey, I'm going to put it out there. Right. I'm not embarrassed, but listen, Tammy came to my house a few weeks back. Your girl didn't take a shower in a few days. I couldn't. I could not wrap my head around the shower that is eight feet from my bed right there. It was too much work. Are you serious? I got to go in there, turn the water on so the water can get warm. Then I got to make sure there's soap in there. And then I have to make sure I have a clean washcloth. And it's too much. I don't stink. I'm good. Like, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you don't sometimes you don't even realize the rut that you're in. Exactly. You don't even realize it, you know? But then you have people who like, yo, you gotta get up. Come on. I feel you. I've been there. Right. And you don't have many of those That's people. Exactly so when you right. have those people, <laughs> you need to harness those people honey, and keep them close. Yeah. Because the other people are saying, Ain't nothing wrong with you, girl. You better go shower. Well, are you serious? Girl, you better go wash. <laughs> all day <laughs> hey, you still sleep yeah. yes because i'm still yeah. mentally drained right. they don't understand the physical aspect that comes behind the mental suffering you know what i mean exactly. um here's another one i wanted to share i didn't know that my father was bipolar until i was diagnosed at 25 he was a severe alcoholic i resonate with that i did not live with him but i stayed with him on the weekends and during summer break looking back now i can't definitely see the signs i was a little irritated that no one told me that bipolar was in my family history you know why they didn't tell you darling because they didn't believe in it or they were embarrassed by it why not tell you why should you not know the mental history of your family? Yes. And denial is one of the main reasons that these type of things are never addressed or mentioned because everyone is in denial or, like you said, embarrassed. Very There's, much so. Go back to that family secret thing again. Yeah. 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 I actually, my last episode, we literally talked about, you mentioned a lot of things that we talked about. We, we mentioned that I'm okay syndrome. Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. I am okay. Here's this wall. I'm okay. And this camera turned off and I'm boohoo crying for the rest of the night. You know what I mean? It's like, that's how we were raised. You gotta be okay. Everything has to be good. You have to be strong. You, you don't have time for weakness. There's no time in the day for weakness. But me being sad is not weakness. That's just how I feel. Right. Don't discredit my feelings. Don't do that. My right. feelings are valid the same way yours are. Exactly. Just mine are different. That's all. Just a little different. You know? Um, here's another one. My mom was diagnosed as borderline, but she refuses to accept or believe her doctor. It's hard. She was so toxic to me growing up. And she made my childhood pure hell she was also physically abusive and would also dump me at various relatives houses i cannot resonate with any of that because my mom didn't want me to go hardly anywhere <laughs> so i really can't resonate with any of that but god i can't imagine growing up and and feeling like your mom was toxic like who the person who brought you in this world and you're in, in the most one of the most important relationships in your life and you categorize her as toxic. How can that not affect a person later on in life? I mean, 
I literally, <laughs> I wouldn't say my mom was toxic, but my dad was definitely toxic. Mm -hmm. He was toxic. <laughs> Um, and that, and that's some strong, that's a strong word right there, you know, um, saying that someone is toxic, that a lot comes with that. That means you are poison. You can kill me. Tox like, they're not saying like, man, she was bad to me. They're saying you're toxic. You're a poison. You can kill me. That's the bottom of the barrel. Like, there's no coming back from that. Yeah. And in a lot of times, that's what the situation is. You can't sugarcoat certain things. But guess what? That toxic run off on your rubs off on your kid, and then guess what? Your kid becomes toxic. So my yeah. question would be, how did she turn out? Yeah. Are you the opposite of your mom? Or are you the same as your mom? Right. Because it's one or two one or two you're either going to be that person that says i don't want to be nothing like you or you're going to be that person that falls into the trap become just like your mom and has no idea that you're just like your mom oh i've seen it <laughs> yeah. i've seen people say yeah i told you my mom was this way you didn't want to listen you gotta learn from yourself but then i looked at you and you that way too you just like her, but you're in denial. Mm -hmm. But that was part of what we just spoke about. Like when it comes to parenting, right. a lot of people become their parents. Exactly. They don't know or, or, or have not even thought about the possibility of making their own choice on who they want to be as an adult or who they want to be as parents. You know what I mean? So a lot of people adopt those poor habits. And again, that leads back to, like you said, the generational curse. You know, literally, you could have went from being around your father and, and abusing your mother, you could have went from that into a relationship where you're being abused, and then your daughter could have grown up in that, and now she's being abused, you know what I mean? And so for me, it was very important to me. I say very early in relationships, yeah, I don't do the physical thing. I totally forgot to mention that you might not want to do that with me because I'm yeah. that type of person. You know what I mean? That earlier. Um, so I, I believe it's a trigger for me. I am going to stand toe to toe with you. Absolutely. You are not going to put your hands on me. You are not even going to tell me I cannot wear tight clothing or i can't paint my nails a certain color or i can't wear my hair a certain way or i can't go outside you are not going to tell me that and that stems from watching my mom and dad be controlled my, yeah my mom was controlled she couldn't do everything i just named no way she could not do it so when i grew up and i got into relationships i was like oh no so I ended up falling into domestic violence relationships myself because I would fight back. I would say, no, I'm, I'm walking out this door. You pull my arm, now I'm hitting you. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah, I get it. I, I absolutely get it. Don't get too close to me and be aggressive. Don't do that. Yeah. I've seen that before. Yeah. And let me just add to that, right? So loved my mom my mom is amazing you know i did everything with her because my dad was either working or when he wasn't working he was on his binges you know what i mean so i even interjected myself into that domestic violence so i wanted to add to that because you are the first person that informed me that i'm a domestic violence survivor i only associated the survivor with the person who was being abused Mm -mm. but yes i survived it too and not only have i survived it it ain't happening right <laughs> you know what i mean like that conversation is very early i just need you to understand this is not how i operate like you know it's not gonna happen so if that's what you need i'm not the right person for you because that's just not I've, I've grown up in it i'm not gonna live my adult life that way you know what i mean exactly. so I was going to share one more, but I really feel like I have some, a couple of important questions that I just want to make sure people get more of a understanding of who you are and what it is that you, you know, experiencing. 
Um, we discussed the triggers around discipline in your children. We discussed the triggers around disagreeing with your significant other. Um, but I have a question. Why write a book? Like, why a book? Why not? I'm gonna do a movie or I'm just gonna do, I mean, I know you also did a nonprofit. Like what made you decide that was gonna be the way I get my story out? I'm gonna do this nonprofit. Please talk about the nonprofit. We haven't had a chance to talk about that. So give us some information. The name of a profit being Prevailing Queens. Again, going to, you can always go to www.prevailingqueens.com. Okay, listen to the words, they're powerful. Why? Like, why this way? Why the nonprofit? Then the book? Then, you know, whatever's going to be next. So, um, I love children. Um, I've always set a goal to start a nonprofit for battered children. And a lot of what we talked about reflects on battered children because mental illness is infused in battered children. This is, it defines who they are. And so I decided, man, I'm going to start a nonprofit to not just put the focus on the woman that's being abused or the man that's being abused, but how it affects the children at the end of the day. Um, and so moving forward from that, I decided, um, I started to go and speak at uh, domestic violence shelters and I thought to myself, what is a way that I could give back? What is a way that I could help others in situations like this? I studied the triggers. I studied how my mom would leave and come right back. I studied everything about domestic violence. And then I came up with the idea of making a woman feel safe. So if she feels safe, she will not return. If she feels it's like she has what she needs to survive she won't return so if you if you provide safe housing there's no need for her to return so i hear it here i am i'm like hey like let me connect with some people let me see how i can put something together so that these women that's afraid to leave because if they leave they're not going to have any money they're not going to have any clothes. They're not going to have a place to lay their head or their children lay their head. They're not going to have a job. Guess what? The places that I connect them with provide every single counseling that there is. It provides the safe housing. It provides meals every day. You can cook every meal that you want. You have your own kitchen. It has a computer room where you can sit in that computer room and you can fill out your applications to get you a job. They provide you with funds. They provide your children with clothing. When I get done with my daughter's clothing or my son's clothing that they no longer can fit, I take the bag over to the shelter and guess what? Now your kids have something to wear. You know, so that was my reasoning. How could I help or give back to these women? And so I decided to put together Prevailing Queens where I could provide safe, safe housing for women. I also acknowledge a powerful woman each day. Um, you know, just acknowledging the fact that you're a woman, acknowledging the fact that you have strength, but acknowledging the fact that you have pushed forward past everything you've been through. You know, and I don't look for people that are already celebrities. I look for the, the people that are moving, pushing, striving, or, you know, women that think, man, I'm not worth it. I put you on my page because guess what? You worth it. I look for the woman who has only 100 followers, but she's pushing towards something. And I say, I'm going to make you shine today. Because now my people get to see who you are and they see what you're trying to do. And guess what? Now you have 300 followers. That's better than 100. And so let me add context to that so people can kind of understand what you are referring to right now. Um, I actually follow Prevailing Queens on Instagram. Um, just so you can know that handle is prevailing underscore queens. So please make sure you check out that timeline there. Um, I actually follow them and I've noticed that you guys have been posting people who actually, you know, give back women who actually are philanthropists, whether it's $5 or much more. Tell yeah. me about that. So, um, I decided to also connect with people that can see 
my people that I'm acknowledging mm -hmm. and they can decide, hey, I want to get back to them too. Or, mm -hmm. hey, you know, um, they're, they're connect. Instantly, I'm tagging you so that people have, you know, a resource to get to you and mm -hmm. see what you're actually doing. And they just say, hey, like, I want to offer something to them or I want to do something for them. And so that's, the, it's, a, it's a strategy within my page. I also do um, inspirational posts. I do that every single morning, even within the Prevailing Queens page, I have inspirational posts. It's just to inspire somebody. You know, I actually deleted the shade room off of my Instagram because I caught myself every morning. The first thing that pops up when I go on my social media is the shade room. And the shade room had something negative every morning. That's not how I want to start my day because it's all about what you feed your brain. So if you feed your brain the negativity from what you just saw on the shade room, guess what? You may have a negative day. And it just so happens like that. So I remove all the negativity. I try to inspire someone. I try to be the first person you see when you wake up or you're on the train or you're on the bus or you're in your car or you're, you know, you're doing something early in the morning, you're taking your kids to school. I want to be the first person you see and you read my words and you say, you know what? This is going to get me through the day. I remember Tammy said this this morning right. and I'm going to keep it pushing. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So what we're doing now is we're manifesting what we want. Right. Exactly. So I don't want to wake up with your negativity. I want to wake up with positivity. And so that's what I do on my page as well for EOTC. You can do it. Everything that I say is about getting up or taking care of yourself. I am never going to say the opposite. And I'm going to let you know, Prevailing Queens have gotten me up a couple of times. It's not only got me up, it's made me open my laptop and say, girl, you better get your life together. I appreciate that. Because it ain't going to... It ain't going to fall on your lap. You got to work for it. You know what I mean? So thank yeah. you for that. Definitely. When I said you're an inspirational friend, I get it. I said it because it, I meant it. Yeah. Not just because it sounded good on here. I mean it. You know what I mean? Thank you so much. Okay. Um, let me see. So we talked about the bug. I think that we, I mean, we can probably go. Listen, people don't even <laughs> understand. You gagging <laughs> us about this mental health illness, but we could talk about it for hours. Yeah. Definitely. We have so much to say. Stop gagging us. Get to know <laughs> us. Be our friend. You're going to want to be our friend. Okay? That brain is special, honey. I promise you that. Um, so it's just a couple of things I want to bring up uh, as far as what she got going on. Um, again, you can follow Tammy on Instagram. Tammy, T-A-M-M-Y Stanley, S-T-A-N-L-E-Y underscore. Okay, that's Tammy Stanley underscore. You can also follow her nonprofit on, on Instagram at prevailing underscore queens. That's P-R-E-V-A-I-L-I-N-G underscore queens with an S. You can also find her on Facebook at Tammy L. Stanley. If you are interested in contributing to her cause, please go to prevailingqueens.com. You'll find information on how to get in contact with her and she'll let you know based on the relationships that she has with domestic violent uh, organizations that assist survivors, she'll be able to inform you of what else, you know, they need and how you can assist. Right. Lastly, lastly, <laughs> lastly, okay, my girl's about to be on the R-A-D-I-O, the radio, check it out, K A J N. 102.9 FM on Thursday. So today is Tuesday, which is what day of the week is it? Let's just make sure I get my dates right, child. Today is the 10th. So Thursday would be the 12th, November the 12th. She would be on 102.9 FM at 10 p.m. There you will have her discussing her book, her experience growing up in a household with domestic violence, the signs of domestic violence abuse, and so much more. I can't give you everything. Like, you got to do something. If I give you everything, you won't do nothing. And a part of this podcast, I need you to do something. Right. So check her out. I'm sure you can find KAJN online. If you are not local to Atlanta, I'm pretty sure you can stream it online. Um, 
again, I want to talk about the book, The Fairy Tale Ends, 1799 plus shipping, or you can get it on Amazon. You can download it to your Kindle. Um, if you do need to purchase an actual physical copy of her book, please go to www.prevailingqueens.com. That is P R E V A I L I N G queens with an s dot com i want to make sure you guys get all this information because it's such a great read yeah. and um you know listen again i'm biased but <laughs> this is my girl i mean i love her we're friends we talk about things i, I facetime every damn day so i think she's great <laughs> right but i know you're gonna feel the same so the last thing i want us to do before you go I want you to definitely grace your presence with people by informing them with any words of wisdom you have. Well, um, I can say this. Since we were on the um, mental illness topic for today, um, I want to say, do your research. You know, if you feel like something isn't what we consider to be normal, then do your research. If you see people responding a certain way or, you know, reacting a certain way, there's something wrong. If you feel like it's wrong, it's wrong. So do your research, you know, go to Google. They never let you down. I mean, they lie sometimes, but, you know, <laughs> they'll give you some clues and hints as to, you know, what may be going on. And then speak to someone about it. I mentioned um, during one of my radio station interviews, for the children, you definitely should find someone that you trust to speak to. Because as I stated, it could either be the person that's being abused that may not make it, or it could be the ch child that decides to snap. And then what? Like your it's child, happened. It's happened. Mm -hmm. It's happened where the son went and grabbed the gun and shot the father because he was abusing the mom. So you want to be very cautious of how you are behaving in front of your children. And for the children, you, I know the teenagers, you guys don't want to speak very often, but the best thing to do is speak on it. And if, even if you aren't speaking or you don't have that relationship with your parents, just find that best friend. Find that, that, you know, that person in school, that teacher, that guidance counselor, that principal, you know, that favorite teacher, somebody to listen to you, even though you may not want something to be reported. But just find that comfort where you can release it because the more you hold it inside and it's bottled up, you may be the one to snap as the child. So moving forward, just like I said, do your research, find someone to confide in, and just, just try to stay positive and pray, pray, pray. My, my, how I get through my days, I pray all day. I wake up three times in the middle of the night, and I pray. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you definitely want to find a relationship with whoever your higher being is, right? Right. I mean, everyone's not. Right. I, I definitely don't. That's why I never, you know, I don't, I'm not promoting anyone's religion or anyone's, you know, preference or beliefs, but you definitely want to tune into something, whatever that is for you. Right. And I think those are great words of encouragement, literally. I mean, they're so real. They're so realistic. You know what I mean? Um, I definitely don't believe that everyone needs to know about your mental illness. Right. Not because I'm embarrassed by it, but not everyone's going to give you the proper response, right? And that could be a trigger. So then you have to find that person. I have several, but <laughs> if you can't find that, if you can't be as blessed as I am to have several who love me, even though, you know, my thought process is a little different. <laughs> I find the one, and typically that one is probably someone who experiencing the same thing. You'll be surprised. Yeah. Who's dealing with the same thing? Because everyone kind of deals with depression. Everyone kind of deals with anxiety. It's just some of us don't bounce back as quick as others. You know what I mean? Listen, Tammy, I. <laughs> Girl, you better not make me cry tonight. My makeup is so fleeky. I try. I, I, look, Girl, do you see it? Do you see? Do you see? 
Do you see this? These underbags are gone. You ain't about to make me cry. This makeup <laughs> is flaky today, honey. Um, I want to say thank you. Like literally, this is episode two. You was like, nah, I'm down. When? <laughs> right. So thank you for that support. That is so just amazing to me. I mean, the, the response has been overwhelming, but I want to personally thank you so much for taking out your time. She's a mom. Her daughter's in that door back there. She's chilling, <laughs> waiting for her mom to get up off this podcast. And again, you could gag us, but we could talk about this shit for hours, right? Exactly. So listen, I'm going to close this out because we have been talking for over an hour now. It's so easy. You asked that, like, Really, an hour and a half, girl, once you start. Yeah, you get into it. And it's... Once somebody gives you the arena to talk about your days that you don't feel good when other people are shunning you, you have so much to say. Yes. You so thank you for being willing to be transparent, right? Thank you so much for sharing your vision. Thank you so much for your, your um, philanthropy, giving back. Definitely appreciate that. We need more people like you. And um, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in. Please check out my girl's website, prevailingqueens.com. Everything you need to know about her is there. Also, uh, listen, I just got an email that a girl been added to Apple Podcasts. I mean, what? Can I get that? I just got my approval letter. I I can't even talk. Okay, I'm stuttering. I'm I'm on Apple Podcasts. I'm on Spotify. It's coming together. It's growing. This is a movement. Please, if you enjoyed today's episode, share it. Let people know what we got going on. We are moving mountains. We are leaping bounds. So please join in our movement of removing the gag, unsilencing us with what it is that we deal with. And the last thing I want to say is, hey, check on your strong friends. Yes, they need, they sure. need you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to Expectations of the Culture. I'll see you next next episode. Have a good night.